This has been an unprecedented year and a truly tragic one for us all. But in this darkness, healthcare workers have been a light for many in their most challenging times. For those of us who work in healthcare, it's been a struggle to stay positive and energized for the sake of those we care for when surrounded by so much uncertainty. Ultimately, we find that it is the support of our friends and family and colleagues that's gotten us through the hardest times. So today, we bring you three voices who will share their experiences from the front lines. These three individuals have each designed humanity into their work and remain a constant source of energy for those around them. This is Design Lab, Voices from the Front Lines, with illustration by Dr. Mike Natter. And I'm your host, Rob Puglisi, Director of Innovation Design with the Innovation Pillar at Jefferson and the co-founder of the Health Design Lab. So what's up, everybody? How y'all doing? Hey, Rob. How's it going? going? So we're a year into this pandemic, and each of you has been on the front line since day one. How do you stay positive every day and keep your tank filled? So for me, it's honestly, it's so it's so cliche, but um, you know, I was I kept a positive attitude through this whole process, just always thinking it. You know, someone else's situation is is worse than mine. But you, you know, honestly, um, I have relied on my colleagues more than other more than ever, specifically now because I feel it. Um, they are truly the only ones that know what we go through on a daily basis. You know, I feel like family and friends, they kind of just are from the outside looking in, but they never really truly understand. So that's, that's how I've been keeping my thing, my tank filled here. Does anybody have any pandemic hobbies they want to share? Oh, I got a lot of pandemic hobbies. So for me, I've been trying to get outdoors as much as possible. So I actually bought, bought a mountain bike. So I've been hitting the trails and uh, getting, getting some sun and seeing some trees and trying to do some outdoor activities as much as possible. And again, too, it's like hanging out with my colleagues and getting support from them like LaShonda and Mike. They've been really inspiring to me personally through the pandemic. Yeah, for sure. I, I also heard Rob that you're uh, not Rob Bond. I heard you doing a little bit of wood chopping as well in the backyard. I am. I'm chopping some wood and making some pizza. Too. Oh, oh brick oven style. Okay. Oh, you can't forget about the surfing. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff. I, uh, Man, I'm gonna, like you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna be a little bit private about my surfing life. <laughs> <laughs> that's just for Bond. <laughs> uh, that's amazing. How about you, Mike? Um, so I've, uh, you know, New York's been pretty, uh, unfortunately, a lot of things have shuttered. So there's not as much to do, although things are starting to open back up. I recently went to some art galleries, which was nice. They're starting to open back up. And for me, my art's always been like my go to when I'm dealing with tough times and when I have some downtime. So um, it really actually ramped up surprisingly how much I ended up drawing this during this pandemic. Yeah, it's nice to have that creative outlet. LaShonda Robertson, you are an emergency medicine nurse at Jefferson. What has the year been like for you, and how does it feel to know that we finally have a vaccine and there is an end in sight? You know, it's been a roller coaster of a year, but um, with us having a vaccine, vaccine um, and our people are getting vaccinated, our citizens, um, I'm really excited to have some light at the end of this tunnel here. You're almost there. It's been a tough one. It's been a tough year. And then Mike Natter, for most of 2020, you were a medicine resident in New York City. Now you're an endocrinology fellowship. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, what was it like being a resident in one of the hardest hit places in the country? And what do you look forward to doing when it's all over? Uh, it was surreal, Rob. I mean, I'm a native New Yorker and seeing the city in that state of you know disarray and seeing the amount of uh, really severely acute sickly patients coming in, um, it was horrific. It was really horrific. But the one thing I know about New Yorkers, and I think it's similar to those in Philly, is that we're pretty tough. And I'm already seeing the tides turn. I'm seeing things open back up. I'm seeing restaurants come back to life. And uh, it's going to be really nice to go sit down in a restaurant, hug my friends, see my family. It's going to be real, real good. Oh, can't can't wait for those days to come. We're, we're so close. And Bon Coup, you're an emergency medicine attending here at Jefferson. And like LaShonda and Mike, you've been on the front lines, you know, since day one, but you also had a book that came out in the middle of the pandemic. So how have you like kept moving forward despite all of these challenges in every aspect of life? Yeah, so actually the book came out right 
at the beginning of the pandemic. So I was, I was scheduled to go on this like awesome book tour all over the country, but it turned into a virtual book tour. But that was cool. I got to drop in uh, in all these different um, places and universities across the country. So that was pretty cool. And yeah, I've been working throughout the pandemic and really, you know, drawing upon the strength of my colleagues at, in the emergency department. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, one of the things that really strikes me from my days um, working as a pharmacist in the emergency department is where I met you, Bon, and, and Mike as well when he was still a student at Jefferson, um, was the resilience of people who work on the front lines, right? And it seems like no matter what happens, whatever walks in the door, there's kind of this unspoken word that we all have each other's back, right? And and, and it's And that's so important. And the pandemic... I think really showed us like how important it was for us all to support each other. Um, you know, even with large gestures, like it was pretty amazing hearing that Jefferson raised millions of dollars for the better together fund to give money to people who were in financial need during the pandemic. Uh, that is really incredible. But then also just small gestures of support from friends and colleagues and family. Um, you know, people, you, you always see people want to know, like, how do you do it? Right. Like, Bon as a doctor, and Mike as a doctor, and Lashonda, you're a nurse in the ER, and the real. Fr- How do you survive every day through this crazy year? And I think that's the secret, right? It's you right. get by with a little help from your friends. Absolutely, that's true. Man, it's been very emotional, um, a crazy whirlwind of a year. You know, right now we're in March of 2021, so it's actually been one year since the pandemic pandemic has hit us here at our back doors, and um, I feel like we. There was so much uncertainty, us not really knowing, um, you know, what would happen next. You know, we never really had answers to any of these questions. You know, I thought about, you know, when the the city first shut down, like, would anyone really listen? You know, would our citizens listen? You know, would would I be safe as a nurse? Will our hospital have an influx of patients? You know, like there was no definite answer to any of these questions. Um, Things change quickly in the ED. I'm sure you guys can attest to that. You know, uh, the acuity of patients were a lot higher. Uh, meaning that they were sicker and that, um, you know, I myself started experiencing more death uh, in the ED, Um, you know, just as the year went went on. Um, More specifically, I remember one one, one patient that we had um, was an elderly lady that came into the ED accompanied by her her husband. Um, You know, she came in for shortness of breath and, you know, per our hospital policy is immediately we separate our patients from our family members, from their family members, I'm sorry. so with that, I care for this this woman for a few hours and, you know, things turned for the worst. They, she, you know, became sicker and sadly she passed away. Um, I remember, you know, the doctor having to go tell this family member who was only a few feet away, you know, in a waiting area that his loved one had passed away and which was our new norm. He just, you know, sat through the door and, you know, the glass doors. And as the doctor told him that news. I remember him just crying, you know, tears falling down his face and him holding his head in his hands. And um, probably, honestly, the second time in my nursing career that I've ever shed a tear, you know. Um, For the last year, we received uh, letters and notes from children and families, restaurants, media outlets saying, you know, thank you. That was that was that was what kept us going most of the time. You know, you know, every day we go into work and we have a new sign or food waiting for us. You know, the things, the little things that made made life better during this time. So, um, but I remember this, this husband specifically him just telling us, thank you, you know, thank you for everything that we had done. And it was at at that very moment while I remember why I became a nurse, still a feeling that's very indescribable, but it was that feeling, you know, for the last year or so, you know, we've, like I said before, we've, we've, uh, leaned on our colleagues to support us through this whole process. Um, and, you know, I just remember us not being alone, you know, um, my little bit of uncertainty, and I wouldn't say little, but my uncertainty, uncertainty definitely changed to reassurance. I was reassured that, you know, um, we strive to do our best as healthcare workers. Um, and I know that, you know, um, I am now safe and that science is real. We now have a vaccine, you know, as we speak, our family members, our colleagues, our parents, our, you know, brothers, sisters, friends are now being vaccinated. So that's, I'm so grateful for that. Um, but as you say, like there's finally a light at the end of this tunnel, you know, we'll have more obstacles that we'll go through, but we finally see the light here. 
Sorry for being so long-winded here, guys. But no, that was amazing. Let's <laughs> no, thank thank you for sharing that. I, I really yeah, appreciate welcome. that. I I appreciate a lot. Also, just like your perspective. I I work with a lot of amazing nurses in New York, and I'm just so honored to work with people like you and and what you guys do and and how much patient facing um, interaction you guys have. Um, you know, the the one of the starkest images I think for me there were many, but one was seeing how many of the IV poles were, you know, we would put them outside the doors of the IV, of the of the ICU rooms and just seeing them amass and seeing the nurses just jump in whenever they needed to. It's just, you know, it was like a bravery. But but to your point of, you know, feeling like your colleagues were your family and your camaraderie, like that really resonates with me. And, you know, for me um, during the pandemic, so I, I was an internal medicine resident. So I, I started my residency in New York City in 2017 after finishing my med school at, at Jefferson. And, um, you know, you even before the pandemic, you kind of grow to really um, you're in the trenches with these kids. You know, these are the, these are your colleagues. Right. So like you you are going through some really harrowing experiences um, just in general in medicine and like seeing, you know, really scary, traumatic things and death and needing to work as a team and work quickly and kind of understand each other. Not to mention, especially as residents, like you're like living with one another for hours on end. Um, one, one of my buddies actually, who I got really close with as an intern was Jack and Jack is just like this great guy. He's really brilliant. Um, he's, he's often described as like a golden retriever. He's, um, overly, overly friendly, like super friendly. Everyone loves him. Um, he's always down to hang out. Um, super loyal guy. And he also has boundless energy that you just don't understand how he has it. It'll be like the end of a 20 hour shift and he's ready to go round two. And it's like, he's just like a golden retriever. Um, you know, but but like you, Lashonda, when I was in the in the beginning of the spring of last year, I was at the tail end of my residency. I was a senior medical resident and I was just burnt out. So I was done. I was ready to, to finish. I wanted to go on to fellowship. I was just exhausted mentally, physically. And this was all before COVID hit. Um, and I just remember hearing I would listen to the news in the morning, um, you know, in like January, February, hearing about, you know, this this virus that's in, in Wuhan and people getting worried it's going to come over here. And then I remember hearing getting more and more nervous and hearing about it out in the West Coast. And that's when it really kind of sunk in that it wasn't really a matter of if, but more like when. And uh, I was. Uh, I was, I guess, at the beginning of an ICU rotation um, as, you know, one of the, the uh, senior residents uh, managing a team. And the first trickle of uh, patients were starting to come into the ICU that were COVID positive, or at least thought to be, because at that time you had to, you know, send the send the COVID to, yeah, in Atlanta, taking weeks to come back. Um, but they tried to kind of shield us from that as much as possible as being residents. And then it just, the onslaught happened and it was a war zone. I mean, there were just, you know, new, like two patients per per room that used to be one. Everyone's intubated. People are intubated on the floor. There's no more ICU beds. We're worried about vents. It was, it was horrendous. It was absolutely horrendous. And there was a palpable fear that no one really spoke about. They just felt it and it was shared. Um, there was one particular moment I do recall quite well, vividly rather, um, I was on a 20 hour call and there's these little kind of cots, these little call rooms that you can go try and take a nap. And, um, you know, my, my stomach was in knots. I was petrified. No one knew what the hell was going on. You know, we were told it's, it's droplet. It's not airborne. We don't need masks. We need masks. We need N95s. We don't, um, you know, the tests are taking forever to come around. We just don't have tools in our tool bag to address this. And I think in medicine, typically, the solace that we get in being able to say, oh, I know what this is. I know how to address this. I know how to treat this. And also I know how to protect myself, God forbid, from exposing myself um, is, is very common in medicine. Um, and that allows a sense of calmness in the face of fear, as I imagine you guys face in the ED quite regularly, is that it's the context. You are in an environment where you have tools, you have colleagues, you kind of know what to do. And this for the first time, I think, in, in at least in my medical career, and I imagine in many others, we didn't have that. We didn't know. And we were exposing ourselves in these air, in these very uncomfortable times. So I went to go try and steal a nap in this, you know, ball of anxiety that I've become. And just as I was about to drift off, I heard bang, bang, bang on the door. 
And I can't remember now if it was the nurse or, or um, one of my, my interns, but uh, you know, oh, Mike, someone, someone's not looking so good. Their, you know, their oxygen saturation was declining, meaning they weren't getting enough oxygen. Um, and this was obviously a patient that we were concerned had COVID. So I ran over there and the ICU has these, do these uh, uh, you could see through these uh, glass doors. And I remember kind of standing there in a bit of a fog, you know, I had just kind of been woken up and I'm still not quite there. And I'm trying to gown up and I'm, I'm just, I'm paralyzed. I'm paralyzed with fear. And, you know, I remember I turned around and Jack's there. <laughs> so Jack, what are you doing here? Um, you know, Jack wasn't on that rotation. He had no reason or business to be there. And he's like, oh, I was just, you know, kind of bumping around. I saw you needed some help. So I just, I came over, you know, all of a sudden Jack's gowned up and we just jump in there and we get, you know, whatever we needed to get and, you know, treated the guy as best we could. But it was, it's exactly what you were describing, LaShonda. It's that camaraderie. It's that, it's that sense of being in it together. And, and honestly, I don't think I would have gotten through any of that without these guys. Absolutely. Yeah. Bon, I feel like that was uh, probably a little bit different than your resi residency experience, huh? Yeah, that was before I knew there was a global pandemic coming on. So there's all these other things that we obviously had to deal with. And, you know, my experience during the pandemic, I think, really started uh, 11 days after the lockdown in Philadelphia. So the lockdown was March 22nd, 2020. And a week and a half later, I had intubated my first uh, patient with um, COVID pneumonia. And it's one of these cases that I will never forget in my life. He was in his early 50s. He was struggling to breathe. And I remember leading up into that procedure, how surreal it was because the day, a couple of days before I had worked in the emergency department, it was kind of like a normal day. But when I got to the ER, I saw all my colleagues wearing full PPE. They looked like they were, I don't know, like space travelers. And they had these black snake-like hoses connecting to their enclosed hoods that were attached to um, a fan that was attached to their waist. And um, everyone was wearing these, um, uh, what color were they, LaShawn? They're like uh, baby blue powder, plastic gowns, right? and these white hoods and it was just so surreal going into that scene and and i felt nervous we were doing we had done simulations of how to intubate a patient it's an aerosolizing procedure so it's one of the most dangerous procedures that we can do in medicine with patients with covid and i remember everyone was crowded around the room and looking and there was this just I don't know. It was like you could cut the tension in the air with a knife. It was just, it was, it was so intense. And I remember before intubating the patient, I had looked around the room and made sure everyone had their appropriate PPE on. I looked at the nurses, the technicians, respiratory therapists, because everyone was putting themselves at risk. Um, and thank God the intubation went well. Um, it was, there was no complications. And, you know, weeks later, I had a search for this patient who ended up in the ICU. And thank God he, he lived and was actually discharged from, from the intensive care unit. Yeah. And it was, uh, you know, and throughout the pandemic, the surreal became normalized, you know, as this pandemic raged up the country. And, um, you know, and another breaking point for the pandemic for me was when, the science became clear uh, on how the virus was transmitted that I, it was just a joy for me to like start sleeping with like my family again. I had like isolated myself on another part of the house and wasn't really like checking in with them, not, not hugging them. And I just enjoyed crawling into my own bed. So that was a turning point for me uh, in the pandemic. And, and obviously in January, when I got my second dose of the COVID vaccine, that was another great turning point. And I think what uh, kind of just got uh, me through the pandemic is um, just my friends and colleagues, um, and especially my colleagues at the hospital, because, you know, going to the hospital, surprisingly, was the most normal activity in my life. You know, yeah, right. I forgot that everyone else was isolated at home on Zoom all day. But I could go in and hang out with you, LaShonda, when we work overnight shifts and 
I was with my friends and colleagues and, you know, we joked about the everyday, you know, challenges of having abrasions on our noses from the N95s. And we complained about people not wearing masks in public when we were wearing our full on PPE in the, right. in the emergency room. And when, we, when we got the new hoods, it was like a, a new Christmas, like a new gift. It was, Christmas Day. it was, <laughs> it was. And then, and then even when like, you know, when people were getting COVID and then we're like, yo, I haven't seen you in a while. When they came back, they're like, oh, I got COVID, but I'm doing better. And we're like, oh, thank God. And so it was like, even when people or colleagues started getting COVID and that we were able to welcome them back into the family. So that really, you know, got me through. Everyone was so inspiring that they would show up to work, get the job done, take care of patients and just have, have, an attitude that wasn't an attitude of 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 defeat that were that this was going to um, that that we were going to get through this together. So that that's what kept me through. Those were some of my fondest memories. I feel privileged to actually work in the hospital with my colleagues. I couldn't be at home Zoom all day, so it was actually nice to have that normalcy in my life going into the hospital. I, I couldn't agree more, Vaughn. It's funny, like exactly what you said, like my best friend who works from home, you know, sheepishly and kind of awkwardly was trying to tell me he's like, I know this sounds terrible, but I'm like jealous that you can get up and go to work. And it's like, I, I get it. No, it's real. It's totally real. And and like, to your point, also, like, there is like a weird sense of a privilege, like a, there was a calling, you know, like when Lashanda was saying, like, why you were a nurse, like, it reminds you why you you went through all these years of training and why you want to um like you it's almost like you've been preparing and training up until this moment when you needed to be called on and i almost feel like i imagine like in world war ii where like if you're like a 17 year old kid you know and you went and signed up it almost felt that had that that kind of like i know this is what i need to do i was scared out of my mind and you know would come right. crying every so day you probably saw on social media as well there people would say like oh it's your job you signed up for it and you're like hell yeah i did you know what i mean like you go in there and like mom when you check that chart and you're like oh they're still alive you like it's an indescribable feeling where you're like i don't know why this was my calling or why did i do it or why i am doing it but at that, fe- that at that moment you're like this is why you can't you can't really can't, you can't really describe it it's just you're grateful, you're happy, and like your team that you have behind you, you're forever grateful, man. Forever grateful. And I feel, I, I feel so close to everyone that I work with in the emergency department because, you know, we are getting through this. There's light at the end of the tunnel. Um, there's less COVID cases. And, you know, and we got through this together. It was, it's just, I'm just inspired by, um, especially all the, all the nurses that I, I get to work with because, you know, LaShonda, you all spend, more time with patients than the physicians in the room, um, you know, putting yourselves at risk and day after day. So it's been, um, I'm, I can't wait till the summer. I think, you know, we're going to be at a better place in, in our country. And I'm, I'm looking for a day when we go all like a hug. And, <laughs> <you know. laughs> Me too. I forgot what those are like. I, <laughs> That's amazing. I, I feel like I feel like when you you know in, in that moment when you were intubating, you've probably done thousands of intubations, and yet like this one felt so different for you, Bon. And you it was like my first intubation ever. I was going like, to ask that, you, yeah. did it take you back to like you document like intubation uneventful, and yet probably the most eventful intubation you might have ever had, right? It was so much adrenaline because you know you we gone through the simulations, and I'm thinking wow i hope i don't get covid from from this patient and then and i and i looked at everyone's eyes because everyone's has the hoods on and but people were like everyone was like oh you know everyone's on edge and and everyone like i could feel it we're all tense but we knew like this is what the patient needed we had trained for this and we all did it together as a team it goes back to that uncertainty as well where you're just like at that moment, I remember even when we did the simulations in the morning, we spent like a half an hour, like cut and dry. This is what it is in black and white. And then we we got in the room. I remember it was probably like my first intubation with you guys too. And it was like, is it too many people in the room? Okay, we need two nurses. We need one to document, one to push meds. And we need a tech because somebody has to do CPR if things go wrong. Like, you know what I mean? Like we have the doctors at the head of the bed and the respiratory therapist. But then 
you you know as a nurse you want more you want all the support that you can get you know what i mean you you don't care if you need somebody to throw you a pulse ox you just want that one more person you know one more person in a room and the fact that with covid and us you know with the with the intubations it was that uncertainty of knowing like are we exposing too many people because pre covid we would love to like that mass chaos, but it's so organized at the same time. We would, we would, we urge for that. Um, but with COVID, man, we had to like really take a step back and utilize all the personnel that, you know, only the personnel that we needed at the time. So it, it, that, that was, that was scary. Oh, there, the, for, for me, the pandemic initially was, I mean, obviously petrifying, but you know, I tried to find what would the silver lining be in all this. And I think it showed, I mean, this was literally the entire world was affected by this. And it showed, I, I, I thought, a vulnerability of who we are as people. We're human beings and we're vulnerable and all of us are vulnerable. So for me, the silver lining I took out of that was it kind of brought to the top what's truly important and it's, it's each other, it's humanity, you know? I mean, yeah, I mean, we don't talk about love in healthcare and we need to introduce love in healthcare. I mean... This is the time when there's too many patients who have been suffering, too many families and caregivers, too many patients dying alone in the hospital. Like more than ever, we need to we need to introduce and bring in love into the healthcare setting. So uh, I think that's one silver silver lining that uh, we are just not organisms, right? We we are uh, we are connected socially. I think that's an amazing way to end this session um, that, you know, kind of we've, we all found each other and, and found humanity in the midst of kind of the biggest disaster of our lifetimes, really beautiful message. So LaShonda, Mike, Bon, thank you so much for kind of opening up and sharing your stories with us. And thank you everybody out there for joining us for this special presentation of design lab voices from the front lines. For more inspiring content from the worlds of health and design, listen to our weekly podcast, Design Lab with Bonku, on whichever platform you use to listen to podcasts. Also, follow the work of the Jefferson Health Design Lab by following us on Instagram at Health Design Lab and on our website at healthdesignlab.com. We hope you enjoyed connecting with our three guests and will consider participating in Jefferson Giving Day. Don't miss your opportunity to save the day and be one of the 3,000 donors needed to unlock $250,000 from Dr. Clasco by midnight tonight. Make your gift right now by clicking that Give Now button right over there on the right side of your screen. Thank you all so much for joining us, and stay safe out there. <laughs>